What Jesus are you seeking? You know, it's amazing to me that the wise men, they were the last ones to see Jesus, the last ones to come to celebrate his birth. It's amazing. They weren't even Colombian, and yet they were the last ones that got there. And it says that when they got there, it says in chapter 2, verse 1 of Matthew 2, and you have it there in your Bible, in your bulletin, said Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship. The baby had already been born. It, it had already happened. And they're coming to find the king of the Jews that has been born. They were seeking him. Now, the interesting part is they were seeking what most people had missed along the way. Most people in that day didn't even know what was going on. There were the shepherds. They had gotten the angels, and they came. And there was obviously Mary, and, and, and there was uh, Joseph, and, and a few others. But most people had missed the greatest thing that had happened. It, it, it was a time of a major upheaval. And you say, what do you mean by upheaval? Well, the Roman government had said everybody must be counted. We must have a census. And when we do census, uh, that means uh, they send us a paper or somebody may come by and we fill it out. If you're in some other countries, they make you stay home till somebody has come by your house literally counted everybody in the house, and then they put a little sign there, and they put a little thing on your thumb and says, okay, you've been counted, you can go out, and everybody else has to stay in their house till that's done. Well, in these days, it was even more interesting. Everybody had to go back to the place they were born. Think about that. Just, just think about everybody here going back to where they were born and take away cars and take away airplanes. Now we're talking some real movement of people. Now we're getting people. All of a sudden, there is a movement of people and wherever there's a movement of people, somebody's going, we can make a profit on this. People are not home cooking. They've got to be out on the road. We can sell food. They're not in their home. They're not where they can sleep. We have a spare room. We can, we can rent it out for a night. Hotels, different things like that. The inn, as it was called. They're going, this is a money-making proposition. Go roam. And so it's going crazy. How many of you did the Black Friday thing? On Thursday? I don't know why we have Black Friday on Thursday, but that's a different issue. I got everything on my list in less than an hour. Life is good. It was over. Go on. Then we start coming down I-75 when we make various stops. Do you realize how much Black Friday there is between Atlanta and Miami? You can stop at every place along the way. It's amazing. And you can do all this and just like all the movement and all the money making, all kind of stuff going on and yet miss. The most important thing that had happened in their day. Max Lucado in his book, God Came Near, chapter one, it's called The Arrival, and it's describing this day and everything. The end of that reading, that chapter says, meanwhile, the city hums. The merchants are unaware that God has visited their planet. The innkeeper would never believe that he had just sent God into the cold. And the people would scoff at anyone who told them the Messiah lay in the arms of a teenager on the outskirts of their village. They were all too busy to consider the possibility. Those who missed his majesty's arrival that night missed it not because of evil acts or malice. No, they missed it 
because they simply weren't looking. They simply weren't looking. May, may I say this? You and I, people who normally would go to church, or at least you're in church this week, you and I could totally miss what Christmas is all about just by going along. Now, I'm not knocking Christmas decorations. Trust me. I married Mrs. Claus. Okay, I, 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 I got that. This is Transformation Sunday, and after we leave, it's all going to change before next week, and my electric bill is going to go up this month. It's like air conditioner, but no air. I understand all this. I'm not against any of that. What I am saying is, if you don't watch out, you will miss what's most important. And that's what happened to them. They missed so, so what I would like to do today is simply introduce you to Jesus or some aspects about Jesus that you may not have considered during the season. Some things about him that maybe might even go against what you had in mind about who Jesus is. Maybe discover some new things about him that would come in really, really handy for you over the next few months. May I introduce you to Jesus? I need some help, though, to start. How many of you, and I know not all of you, but how many of you, growing up, you sang the song about Zacchaeus? You, you sang the song. You remember the song? Do you, do you remember the motions? Okay, Jill, you raised your hand. I want you up here. Raquel, you too. Come on. Come on now, now, come on, come on, come on. Steve, you're up here, you raised your hand, you raised your hand. Back there we had uh, guys, I saw a clump of guys that say, two or three of you, no, up here on top, no, no, on top. Up here, over here. We're gonna do this right. We're gonna do this right. Guys, some of you raised your hand. Do I have to call you by name, Ermit? Do I have to call you by name? Did you raise your hand, Ermit? Who raised it? Kampa raised his hand. Come on, come on. Come on. Here we go. You may... <laughs> okay. Come on up to the front. Y'all are pathetic back there. Just want you to know. Anybody on this side? You're going, nobody is raising their hand anymore. They will never raise their hand again. Move up, move up. I'll, I'll pull this over. Okay, now, with full motions, you got it? Okay, you full, well, then watch her while she's doing it. Okay, does anybody know the motions? Raquel, watch Raquel, okay? And, and she may have them wrong because she learned it in Peru, but we'll work it out. Okay, here we go. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior looked away, he looked up in a tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, because I'm going to your house today. All right, stop a minute. Then I put, no, 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 back up here, all three of you. No, 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 That was okay, okay? But did you notice something about the song? And, and we've done this for generations. We've taught generations of kids this song. And when Jesus is talking to Zacchaeus, what's he doing? You, da, da, da. Now, I have a question. Every child... Does this mean good? This is bad. And Jesus, to generations of kids, have come across as a guy who is forever getting on to us. Correct? Let's present a new Jesus. Let's start a new trend today, okay? Instead of doing this Jesus, let's just invite Zacchaeus to come down, okay? Can we do that? All over again. Ready? Here we go. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. 
He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior walked away, he looked up in the tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. Now give them a good round of applause. There we go. That will be on YouTube and we will start a whole new generation of songs going out. And why is this important? Because so many people have this idea that Jesus is always a Jesus that's getting on to us. And yet, that's not the Jesus that's in the New Testament. We don't find Jesus getting on to people that are trying to come to him. We don't find Jesus getting on to tax collectors who simply wanted to see Jesus, even if they were short. Now, here's a tax collector. What was a tax collector? Well, a tax collector was, first of all, a traitor to the Jews. He was not only a traitor, he was a thief by and large because he not only charged them what the Romans wanted, he padded his pocket with anything over that. And with the backing of the Roman government, literally he stole from the people. So much so that Zacchaeus later said, if I've ever taken anything from him, I'll pay him back four times. Now think how much he had to have to be willing to do that, to pay back four times over what he had gotten. And yet, there's nothing in this story that tells us or implies that Jesus got on to him. Notice what it says in Luke 19, 5. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Does that sound like someone that's getting on to him? No. He's saying, Zacchaeus, come down here. I want to go to your house today. Now, going to someone's house, entering their house, eating with them, staying with them, implied you're okay. In fact, later on, we see that all the religious leaders are going, why is he hanging around with the tax collector? Why is he doing that? I, I can't believe he would even be there with them and let, that was not Jesus' attitude at all. Jesus' attitude and the Jesus that we see is a Jesus that is excited to be with you no matter who you are or who you think you are. There are people that, that don't come to Jesus because they say, man, I, I can't handle all the finger pointing. I can't handle all the, they're going to get on to me. My life is too bad for this. No, no, no. That was not Jesus. That was the Pharisees. That was the Pharisees. He was saying, I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I want you to know that I want to have a relationship with you. I am excited to be with you, whoever you are. Maybe today, you kind of look at yourself as a non-church person, but you got stuck coming today. That's okay. I just want you to know, Jesus is glad that you're at least considering him. He is excited to have a relationship with you. Not because of what you've done, but because of what he wants to do for you. Second, I want you to see another side of Jesus. This side of Jesus we find in Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 is the parable of the prodigal son. Prodigal son. 
just, just when we say the word prodigal, we're thinking, this is not good, right? Here, the prodigal son is one who was the youngest one in the family, okay? Number one. And he comes to dad and he says, dad, I want you to give me everything that rightly belongs to me. Now, first of all, what does that imply? He was supposed to get something of what the father had, but he was supposed to get it when? When the father died. So basically what he is saying is, Dad, I wish you were dead, but since you're not, go ahead and give me what you're going to give me when you die. I don't really care about you, Dad. I really don't care about being with you or being in your household. I don't like the rules you have. I don't like the way things are done. I'm 18 now, or at least whatever that phrase was in those days. I'm 30 now, and so I think I know what to do. So give me what is mine, and I'm out of here. Amazingly, amazingly, the father says, here it is. He could have said, forget you. I'm not dead yet. You sit here, and if you're not here and crying when I die, you don't get anything. He didn't hold it over his head. He just simply gave him. Now, again, this is a parable. And in every one, you can see who is who. And and you can go beyond this. So this one who left the family, who walked away with the good stuff he had, went out and it said he wasted it in riotous living, it says in one pair. In other words, he just wasted. He partied hardy. He just had a good time. And sure enough, you get a lot of friends when you're partying and have money. You get a lot of people who want to be your friend. And life is good and you're living large and things are going good. And then all of a sudden, little by little, it all starts disappearing. And one day he runs out. But it's okay, he had a lot of friends. And yet none of his friends were his friends anymore. Now it's tough. But he's resourceful. He can do it. I can make it happen. So he goes out looking for a job, and the only job he can find is feeding pigs. Now, this does not put any pig farmer down. Trust me, I fed pigs for many years. This is is okay, feeding pigs. But to a Jewish young man, feeding pigs was about the lowest thing there was. Feeding pigs and being really hungry is not a good combination particularly when you can't eat pig. I mean, it's not like if it was a Cuban, you know, one pig would disappear ever so often. <laughs> but this a nice Jewish boy couldn't do that. And so he is simply trying to see if he can eat a little bit of what the pigs are eating. And this is not good. I love this passage. It says, and then one day, He lifted up his eyes. He got his head out of the pig pen, out of the pig trough. He lifted up his eyes and and he said, wait a minute. Back at my father's house, even the servants were doing better than this. I mean, even the servants that were working for my father, he took better care of them than I am able to take care of myself. And so I'm going to go back and I'm going to tell my dad, listen, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against God. I'm not worthy to be called your child anymore. I just want to live like one of your servants. So he gets up. Verse 20. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. This son who had wasted every 
good thing that his father had given him. This son who was dirty and smelly, he had walked for days, he was not really in any shape to be hugged or kissed by anyone. And yet his father, excited to see him, the father who was waiting for him. He ran to him. The son did not run to the father. The father ran to the son. And when he got there, he embraced him. I want you to, to know a Jesus that is excited to welcome you back to the family that misses you. There are a lot of people who grew up singing Zacchaeus. Got the wrong idea of God, but grew up. They knew the Bible stories. They, they knew the things. They knew the truths. Had even accepted. Had even maybe shared it with someone else. And yet, at some point along the way, they said, I'm going to take all of these things that God gave me. And I'm going to try to play it out my way. I want you to know that Jesus doesn't care what you've done. He doesn't care how much time you've wasted or how many resources you've wasted. Jesus is here going, you take one step in my direction and I am running in your direction to welcome you back home. That is the Jesus that some of you are looking for. Some of you think you're going to get stiff-armed by Jesus. Like, I'm going to come back and I'm going to get out of there. And there may be one or two church dorks who do that to you, but I want you to know it's not Jesus. Jesus welcomes you back. He says, I'm, I'm happy to have you back in the family. Let me introduce you to another Jesus. This one we find in John chapter 11. John chapter 11 is a story where Jesus has some very good friends that live in Bethany. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And, and he gets word from Mary or Martha that says, your friend Lazarus is really sick. And he says, okay. But he doesn't leave. Have you ever got word that someone is sick and you took off? You just get in the car and take off? I know I have. We have family a long way away, and sometimes we get word that, hey, something's going on, and we just simply throw in clothes, throw a few things in the suitcase, and whatever we forget, we'll buy along the way, and, and we take off. Jesus didn't take off. He hung around. Well, some of the disciples were kind of leery about going to Bethany anyway because in Bethany was real close to Jerusalem and they knew that the Jews were out to kill Jesus and probably were out to mess with them too. So they weren't real happy about going in that direction anyway. And so finally four days into it, Jesus says, Lazarus is sleeping. And one of them goes, well, if he's sleeping, that means he's going to get better. No, no, I don't mean sleeping as in sleeping. I mean he's dead. Well, then there's really nothing we can do. But we need to go. And so Jesus and a few disgruntled disciples take off to Bethany. When they get to Bethany, Martha meets Jesus outside of town and says this, if you had only been here, if you had only been here, in other words, if you had been here, you could have healed my brother, your friend. I, I know you can because I've seen you do so many things like this before. If you had just shown up, question, have you ever felt like if God had just shown up, things would have been different? Have you ever been kind of disappointed with God because he didn't do what you thought should happen? In fact, some people have walked away from God because they were disappointed that God didn't show up when they thought he should in the way that they thought he should. It says, 
And Mary was back at the house. She was crying. She was, she was crying so much and had friends around her that were crying and grieving also. Notice what it says there in your bulletin. When Jesus saw her weeping, because they came out, Mary came out to where he was. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him, he asked them. And they told him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35. Then Jesus wept. And the people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. I have a question. Why did Jesus cry? Didn't Jesus know he was about to raise him from the dead? You would think, right? Jesus knew what he was about to do. He knew what he could do. Why did Jesus weep? Just so that young people would have a really short verse when they ask him for a memory verse? We could say, Jesus wept, got mine learned. No, there, there has to be another reason for this. Notice when he wept. He wept when he saw Mary weeping. Mary was grieving. And he was grieving with her. Think about that. A Jesus that hurts when you're hurting. Yesterday, Bev and I, just, just celebrating the fact that we could go out and pedal on flat ground with less than three layers of clothes, we went out and biked, and we stopped somewhere along the way. I'd gone into the restroom and came back, and there was a man there, and he and Bev were in a conversation. And at the end of the conversation, Bev said to him, well, you have a great weekend. And he said, I would, except my wife just passed away three weeks ago. What do you do with that? You're thinking... This guy is just hurting so much that even though he was smiling, even though he was, he was making jokes about some other thing, I mean, inside his soul, he's just hurting. He's just hurting. My niece, back in July, her mother passed away after a very brief battle with cancer and she died in July young woman and my niece is now going through every holiday and every tradition that they've done with herself and her grandkids and everything every one of these you're going through that whole first year and it just hurts and you can see it it just hurts she's just grieving and, and you get some people that say, well, you shouldn't be grieving. You're a Christian. Wrong. You can be a Christian and grieve. It said, Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be what? Comforted. See, when Jesus is brought into the mourning, grieving process, then all of a sudden it's something that we can handle. There is the grief there is the thankfulness and there is the comfort that God brings into it all. And Jesus is here grieving with Mary, crying with her. I understand your pain and I'm sharing in it. People should never have to grieve alone. Jesus is always there. And we should be too. But Jesus, not only the one who is welcoming you to a relationship, not only one who is saying, hey, come back, I'm, I'm glad you're here. He's also weeping with you, crying with you when you're hurting, when you're sad. The fourth 
facet of Jesus I want you to look at is in Luke chapter 22. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus is with his disciples, and this is, this is right before he's going to be crucified. And he says to Peter, and he calls him Simon, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Have you ever seen wheat? Now I know some of you haven't because I took a time group up north and we had a field of wheat and they all thought, what is that? They didn't know wheat came in anything but five pound bags. That's wheat. When you get a hold of some wheat and you start shaking it, you know what happens? It kind of comes apart. It just kind of goes everywhere. And in fact, to, to, to get the wheat that you and I have, you almost have to take it and you have to put it through a process. Many times they'll have horses or whatever step on it, or I'm sure there's machinery now that does it a whole lot better than horses, but they'll take it and they'll separate it and they'll throw it off and parts will blow away and the good stuff will come down and all that. But that process is a violent process. And Jesus told Peter, he said, now Peter, listen to me. Satan has asked to take each of you and shake your world like wheat. But I have prayed for you. Have you ever gone around to someone else and say, please pray for me? Anybody done that? I, I think that's a wonderful thing. I dare say none of us has asked anyone to pray for that has quite the connection that Jesus himself has. And Jesus prayed for Peter. That means that Jesus, at the right hand of the Father, turns to the Father and intercedes for him. Have you ever felt like your world just kind of falling apart? Have you ever felt that no matter what you do, your life is just getting shaken up and you're, you're, you're even trying to do what's right, and yet it just seems like everything is going wrong? Have you had one of those days? If you had one of those seasons, because often it's not a day, it's like a week or a, a two week or a three month or a year. And you just get shaken. Well, here's Jesus. He says, I knew this was coming. I am praying for you. I am praying for you. Is that the Jesus you need today? The Jesus that says, I know what you're about to go through. And I know it's going to be rough. But I just want you to know, I am interceding to the Father for you. It says, <laughs> Did you listen carefully? And when you have repented, in other words, you're going to fail this one, Peter. I know you're going to mess up. I know that. But when you repent, when you come back, I'm welcoming you back in. And I'm letting you know you've gone through that so that you can encourage and strengthen someone else. Let them know God is also praying for them. You know what? We have some people that aren't in church today because Satan has shaken up their life. He's got them like wheat and he's just, and I'm not saying everybody that's not in church today is getting attacked by Satan. That's not it. Okay, everybody got that? Get, get that out of your head. Some of you are going, where's Marcel? He's being shaken like, no, he, he's at church in Orlando, I'm sure. 
Okay, that, that's not the point. But I get, I guarantee you, some people, their world is being rocked. We need to pray for them, yes. But they need to understand that Jesus is also praying for them. That's the Jesus. Finally, the last Jesus I want you to understand and be aware of this season. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 that doesn't appear there. It says, come unto me all you who are burdened, heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. But then it gets to the next verse. Take my yoke upon you. Now, some of you are reading that because you're city people, and you're looking at that and going, that's why I only do egg whites. I don't do yolk. Okay? A yolk is not the part of an egg. Okay? A yolk is a piece of a farm implement that you put on one ox, usually an older one, and it's tied into another ox, usually a younger one. And the older one teaches the younger one how everything works better. And so Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. And some of you are going, no. I don't want the Jesus yoke on me. I don't want to do what Jesus says. That's so heavy. And I hear people say all the time, it's so hard being a Christian. It's just so difficult. See, he's not talking about rules and regulations. No, he is saying, get under this with me and let me show you how you can make a difference in this world. Let me help you. How many of you are married, husbands? How many husbands do we have here? Raise your hand high. Okay, I'm talking to you. I don't care how long you've been married. I don't care how many marriage books you read. You will never understand that woman <laughs> that you have married. But I got that? Amen. You may think, <laughs> you may think you've got her figured out. And by cusses, she will change. <laughs> now, all of you that are just getting married or thinking about it, you know, <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I always like to watch the young ones. They go, oh, no, I know her. Oh, yes. <laughs> you don't know her. And, and here's the deal. I've been married 40 years. I have read more marriage books than most of you, okay? Let me just start with that. Why? Because I had to teach you, and so I had to learn a lot. So I read far more marriage books, and still, after 40 years, she will ask me a question, and before I answer it, now I used to, in my youth, in my young stupidity, I would answer. How do I look in this dress? Don't get caught. That's a trap. Do not answer that question. Ah, uh, you answer things like, how do you think you look? I think, well, but then you, yeah. Don't go down that road. There, there, are, there are questions she asks, and you answer it, and then she will let you know I was not looking for an answer. Inside of me, I'm going, then why ask the question out loud? And I'm the only one in the car with you. Right? Some of us older guys, we figured this out. 
And we still don't have it all figured out. And Jesus says, listen to me. I understand her better than she understands herself. Get in the yoke with me and let me show you how to live with her and be happy. Sign me up for a yoke. I mean, we need to have yoke seminars, right? Like, yes, I'll take the yoke upon me and learn from you because I don't understand. How many of you are parents of children? Okay. <laughs> well, some of you are parents of dogs. I understand that. And cats. So that's a whole different breed. But anyway. Your parents. You think you know, but you don't. My son, I remember the day they had just had Sarah's, uh, whatever we had, baby shower. And she starts having contractions during the baby shower. That's a good indication it's time to speed the shower up. And he comes to me and says, Dad, we're, we're leaving. for the, Don't tell anybody, but we're leaving. And then he comes back in and he says, Dad, how, when did you know you were ready to become a father? This is as his wife is getting in the car. I said, the day you got married and I sent you away. He did not like that answer. In fact, to this day, he still complains about that answer. Why? Because none of us know. None of us fathers and mothers have it. We think and then it all changes. You think you got this and then you have a second child. And God forbid you have a third one. Then it's all bets are off. There's no way to figure it out after that. You do your best. You follow the things that you know. But let me tell you something. You want to be a better parent? Get in the yoke with Jesus. And let him guide you through this minefield called raising kids. It's tough. It says, get in the yoke. Learn from me. How many of you are between 18 and 24? Raise your hand. I'm looking around, some of you are getting quite old. You used to raise your hand about this. Let me tell you something. You thought that at 18, you would have it figured out. The closer you get to 24, you figure out, I don't really know what the heck is going on. You're, you're, you're in college. You're, you can see the degree right there. And the closer you get to the degree, the more you figure out, okay, now what? <laughs> right? Now what? When you started that degree, there were so many jobs for that degree. Now that you are got the degree, nobody's hiring. Have you noticed that? What's even worse, you got a degree in something that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> That's the scary part. Wow. Russell, how do you face life? How, how do you look ahead? How do you plan? Someone said, you know, you got to have your one-year goal and your three-year goal and your five-year goal. Do you realize that in five years the world moved? <laughs> it's not even there. Let me help you. Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you. Get in the yoke with me and let me take you day by day. Forget your five year plan. Just stay in the yoke the next five minutes and you'll be ahead of the game. 
Get in the yoke with him. Because he says, I'm inviting you to join me in making a difference in this world. Jesus. This is the real Jesus. Not the Jesus. The inviting Jesus. The welcoming Jesus. The Jesus who cries with you. The Jesus who prays for you. The Jesus who says, come along. Let's do this together. For many months, the wise men followed the star. And it says in verse 9, And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house. They're not at the stable anymore. They entered the house, saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped. Worship. What do you do with this Jesus that invites you? that welcomes you. This Jesus that is grieving with you, that is praying for you, that says, come alongside of me and let's walk this. What do you do? You just simply worship him. You just simply worship him. I don't know what Jesus you need today. But I say this, if you ask him with all your heart, you know which Jesus you need right now. You know which Jesus you need. And the beauty is, the Jesus you need is right here. Right here for you today. Don't miss him. Don't miss him. There's all kind of stuff going on. The minute the service is over, bam, things start happening. People start going. You know, Don't miss the Jesus that is here. Saying, I am here. I want to have a relationship with you. I don't care what you've done, what you've, where you've been. What, I'm here. He's the one that's saying, welcome back to the family. He's the one that is saying to you right now, I know you're hurting. And I want you to know that I'm hurting with you. The one that is there praying for you because he knows you're going through a tough time. And he knows what's ahead. And he's already bathing those days in prayer. He's the one that's saying here. You don't know what to do with your business? Get in the yoke with me. You don't know about this or that decision? Get in the yoke with me. I am here. Just worship me. Let's walk together. Would you bow your heads, please?